I can see thank that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thank you for the introduction. I apologize in advance on my poor use of PowerPoint because unfortunately I'm not very talented with this, as you will see as we go through. Um, so it's, oh, yeah, I've gone too far. Uh, how do I go back? Can I go back that way? Yeah, okay. Um, the term patent, that derives from uh, traditional letters patent, which were official documents, normally from the monarch, widely used over the centuries, still in use today for uh, uh, major announcements, providing authorizations, uh, things like that. So if somebody, say, gets uh, 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 an award, becomes uh, uh, a member of the House of Lords, or gets awarded the KBE or whatever else, uh, uh, the, uh, the announcement is made by means of a letters patent. And um, the word patent is Latin for open. And the whole point is that uh, the open letter is uh, one which anybody can read. So it becomes a public document. Um, now, uh, if you can see my cursor is now on uh, the uh, Hungarian uh, document, and that will be familiar to you, uh, those of you who actually uh, listened to Wendy's wonderful talk on um, watermarks last time, um, because this uh, particular stamp does indeed show watermarks on the left, uh, in the column on the left. But the main part of the stamp is in fact a Hungarian lat letters patent. Uh, so uh, 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 that one stamp covers both uh, my interests and Wendy's interests. Okay, this little fellow is the oldest item I have in my stamp collection. It is dated 1355. Uh, the 29th year of the reign of Edward III. It's in French, and it is a letters patent appointing John Bonington to the office of auditor for the Duchy of Lancaster, with responsibility for much of the north of England. It was written in London, but the seal is lost. I'm not going to go through the detail of the text, but just think, this is 666 years old, which is a pretty significant date. And... Uh, uh, it is by far the oldest item in my collection of all my philatelic collection. This is actually, it's spread out uh, and um, uh, I'm not expecting you to read it. I, I can't understand it. It's in strange language, it's in sort of ancient French. The most famous letters patent, I suppose arguably, is Magna Carta. Um, and here I've got a couple of items. Uh, Gibraltar stamps for the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, showing how the original looked above. And below, you see the images of the uh, British stamps celebrating the same anniversary. But this is actually in a uh, wrap of uh, milk chocolate bar. So I thought that was a bit unusual. But, uh, uh, I've got the stamps as well, of course, but it's actually from a milk chocolate bar. So letters patent were very often used to establish colonies, districts, or towns, and the announcement would be made by letters patent. We hereby uh, announce that the uh, following town or district uh, 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 be created. And uh, these stamps are some examples of uh, um, anniversaries of the issuing of particular letters patent in the case of uh, Newfoundland, South Georgia, Turks and Caicos Island, Tristan de Kuna, and then at the bottom you have a cover 250th anniversary of the Queen Anne anniversary for Bay Shore. So uh, these are just uh, examples. In the case of Mauritius, the letters patent were issued in France originally and 1978 definitive stamp for Mauritius uh, showing part of the letters patent ex establishing the possession of uh, what was the island of Mauritius issued in 1715 by Louis XIV uh, to uh, an individual. 
And this particular example, uh, you've got the stamp, and then the low example is an imprint, imperforate pair. Next, we have um, the uh, letters pattern that established South Australia, and you're not going to be able to read it. This is part of my problem with the PowerPoint, but there is a reference here, if I can get the cursor, to letters patent uh, on this cover. So this was the back and front of the first day cover celebrating the 150th anniversary of the founding of South Australia. There's a village in the USA called Holland Patent, and this was founded in 1797, and once again, named after the letters patent relating to the grant of land uh, allowing its foundation. And I've got a few covers from Holland Patent. Uh, it still exists, and you can get more recent postmarks, but you've got an 1869 miscent cover with a blue Holland Patent uh, postmark, uh, addressed to Danvers Centre in Massachusetts, and then below an 1818 cover from Holland pa Patent to Paris, forwarded onto the Grand Hotel Vienna, and it has various Paris postmarks on the back. However, the focus of my talk is not so much these things as patents for invention. In the 16th and 17th century, uh, in the United Kingdom in particular, uh, or I should say Great Britain or England even at that time, um, patents were abused by the English monarchs. And the way they abused them was to grant somebody a monopoly on the making of something, the use of something, uh, uh, importing of things, exporting of things and so on, uh, in return for money. And so the monarch gained money and in return granted these monopolies. Um, and to stop this abuse, the English Parliament in 1624 forced James I to sign the Statute of Monopolies, which restricted the granting of such monopolies by means of letters patent to inventions. This arguably was the per first patent for invention law any in the, anywhere in the world, though people have said that Venice had something similar uh, a couple of hundred years earlier, or 150 years earlier. But uh, this was the first one which really was straightforwardly for invention. The um, Venice one uh, was more to protect uh, the monopolies in very, very restricted areas, um, whereas the English one was for any invention in any subject. England was followed by many other countries with similar laws. Uh, the other stamps, apart from James I here and here, uh, are uh, some examples of notable inventions uh, and inventors uh, on British stamps, including James Watt, um, uh, the famous inventor. 2010 booklet celebrating the 100th anniversary of the new Dutch Patent Act. Uh, the previous act uh, had been suspended in 1869 and for nearly 40 years the Netherlands was the only advanced economy that did not have a law for patents for invention. But it then uh, resumed in 1910 and this is the, uh, a booklet uh, which is 100 years of Dutch patent law. Now, an awful lot of famous people have worked with patents one way or another. And you can see here, for example, uh, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, you have also got uh, Edwin Stanton here, served as Secretary of War under Lincoln. He was uh, uh, involved with patents. Uh, you've got uh, General Monash, uh, the World War I general, had been a patent agent. Albert Einstein famously uh, was working in the Swiss Patent Office when he developed all his major theories uh, 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 about relativity and E equals mc squared. But I want, particularly want to draw your attention to this lady in the middle, Clara Barton. Um, she joined the US Patent Office in 1855 as a clerk. 
um, and she was the first female civil servant in the USA. So she broke a barrier there. And what's more, she was paid exactly the same as the male clerks were uh, in the US Patent Office. She was sacked in 1856 because of her support for the abolition of slavery. Um, she returned to work in the Patent Office on uh, Abraham Lincoln's election as president in early 1861. But then, uh, following the outbreak of the American Civil War, she became known as the Florence Nightingale of uh, the American Civil War. She uh, set up the US Red Cross, what is now known as the United States Red Cross, and she um, uh, is famous really for that, rather than for the fact that she was a groundbreaking civil servant in uh, the US Patent Office. I will come back to her later on as well. First head of the US Patent Office was Thomas Jefferson. Uh, under the first US Patent Act, and until 1836, the US Secretary of State, in other words, the Foreign Secretary in UK parlance, was also the head of the US Patent Office and had to approve or reject each patent application that came in. However, it was really a, very much a notional uh, rejection. It wasn't a case of he checked uh, that this was a, a genuinely new invention or anything like that. All he had to do was check that the formalities had been done. In other words, a fee had been paid and uh, uh, a request had been made on the right form. Anyway, he uh, uh, was, of course, uh, Secretary of State from 1790 to 1793, one of the founding fathers of the USA. He did apparently take his duties of checking uh, the uh, formalities were okay of patent applications during that time. Here are a couple of patent office pioneers. Uh, the first one is a free frank letter sent to Moses Poole of, at the UK patent office. Poole was one of the very first patent examiners of the patent office. Patent office uh, 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 started the, the UK patent office started to employ examiners to actually check whether the invention was sufficiently novel uh, uh, and was worthy of therefore receiving patent protection. Um, and but at the same time, he carried on as a patent agent. Now that's something which would be impossible these days because the two uh, jobs are incompatible. To be a patent agent, you're acting on behalf of an inventor and trying to get uh, the inventor uh, the monopoly protection that the patent allows. But to be a patent examiner, you are, are checking that the invention is indeed worthy to be protected. So he, he uh, basically had a conflict of interest. How this was allowed, I have no idea. But anyway, uh, this is a uh, three frank letter in my possession uh, sent to Moses Poole at the patent office. And below um, you have uh, what I've now described as the first head of the US patent office, and this I'll be, by that I mean the first proper head, I'll explain what I mean in a second, Harry Ellsworth. Um, he was uh, very prominent in encouraging both Samuel Cole is it Samuel Colt or Samuel Morse and Colt to patent their key inventions, the, the gun and the Morse code. Um, There's an undated Free Frank letter signed by him and sent from uh, the uh, patent office. So the new US Patent Act in 1836 gave the Commission of Patents, which was a new title, uh, uh, still somebody who had to be appointed by the president and with Senate approval, the power to assess patent applications uh, for usefulness, novelty, and, and basically that it abided by all the rules. So Harry Ellsworth headed the US Patent Office from 1835, when he still had the old rules that Jefferson worked under, but in 1836 he got these new powers to actually assess properly what the invention worthy of a patent. 
free franking privilege for the head of the patent office actually dates back to 1827. Um, next we have Bennett Woodcroft. He was the leading figure in UK patent reform. He was a patent agent before he joined the UK Patent Office in 1852, um, but he didn't try to run both jobs uh, simultaneously. And here is a letter uh, addressed to him. He was Professor Woodcroft. I, don't, I can't remember what he was a professor of, uh, addressed to him when he was a patent agent. And here's another example of Bennett Woodcroft. This is an 1850 letter from Edwin Haycock, who is paying Woodcroft 40 pounds, two 20 pound notes, which were enclosed in the letter, to pay for a patent grant. So Woodcroft had succeeded in getting a patent for uh, Edwin Haycock, and, uh, but it required a further payment of 40 pounds, and two 20 pound notes were paid. And there's the actual text, or the, as much of the text of the letter as I can uh, 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 deduce. And it said, Dear Sir, well, uh, something or other, I propose seeing you in London. Enclosed is £40 in two banknotes, £20 each, with their numbers given. I am yours truly, Edwin Haycock. And it, uh, the letter has various postal markings. And here's the patent. Uh, so this is the first page of Edwin Haycock's uh, patent. Uh, uh, Bennett Woodcroft specialised in helping inventors get patents relating to textile manufacturing, and this is in fact uh, finishing and dressing woolen cloth. This particular patent. Okay, patents invention can be controversial. Some people are very much in favour of it. Uh, and here you have the National Patent Council of the USA. It has this uh, uh, slogan, meter mark, patents make jobs. So certainly some people really like patents. But on the other hand, you have critics of the patent system as well. And two notable critics, Charles Dickens, uh, he was a persistent critic of the slow bureaucracy of UK Patent Office in 19 century. He wrote a polemical article in 1850 entitled The Poor Man's Tale of a Patent, and in Little Dorrit, his hero, Daniel Doyce, is so frustrated by the system that he sells his invention to the Russians, who reward him. And bear in mind, this uh, uh, book was published at the time of the Crimean War, so uh, UK was at war with the Russians at that point. And uh, you have here a stamp uh, and a, a Cinderella item of Charles Dickens. And then below, we've got Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Um, he wanted the patent system abolished. He was partly motivated by the poor experiences his father, another engineer, had uh, with the UK patent system, and partly by his own business practice and as a matter of political principle. He was opposed to uh, patents. Moving on to philatelic items. Some of you will know, or probably most of you will know, uh, uh, the famous treasury competition in 1839 um, uh, for the development of uh, ways of paying postage. And James Bogardus, won a hundred pounds prize. It was one of the joint prizes uh, given to the best entries. And though, even though they didn't follow uh, Bogardis's ideas and followed Roland Hill's ideas instead, Bogardis himself um, won the money. This is the front cover of the patent specification and he says applying stamps to letters etc. And this is the front page of the patent. And the whole point of his invention was not to use gum stamps. Instead, a seal attached the stamp to the envelope. So the stamp was not gummed, it was not adhesive uh, under Bogardus's invention, um, but it was stuck to the envelope uh, with a seal. 
So that's what his invention, which as I say, was not adopted. So Roland Hill, of course, um, you all know about inventor and postal reformer. What you might not know is uh, that he had a vested interest in the success of his scheme because he'd obtained a patent for printing presses in 1835 and his brother, Edwin Hill, patented an envelope making machine later on in 1845. The reason why I like this particular cover is that a Portugal stamp of 1940, the first ever to show Roland Hill. Um, it's on a 1941 censored cover from one firm of patent agents to another firm of patent agents. So it actually is most appropriate uh, that uh, the link to patents is there. Uh, both the firms, both the firm that sent this letter and the firm that received this letter are still active patent agencies in their respective countries. Okay, going on, an 1829 entire from Mr. Pooley of the Patent Office, Lincoln's Inn, uh, to Mr. Green, requiring payment of 21 pounds, 12 shillings and 11 pence for the grant of four patents. And uh, this is the letter, uh, it has a, a TP Chancery Lane uh, hand stamp and a two charge mark, and there's the contents of the letter uh, uh, requiring the payment. Patent Office for a while had um, official stationery, uh, and this was, uh, uh, and I've got some examples of both specimens and the final example, uh, the final issued uh, copy uh, of different types of this reply paid card. So what it was, was um, a card, to be sent to the Controller General of the Patent Office, 25 Southampton Buildings, London. Uh, and uh, it was requesting a copy of a patent specification, the patent document. Uh, and uh, that particular uh, uh, request uh, cost seven pence halfpenny. So he, he bought this card in advance. Uh, you could then fill out the um, uh, uh, details of the patent specification you wanted, and you would then post it to the Controller General, and you would give your name and address uh, of, for where the patent would be sent. Here's a well-traveled letter from the Patent Office, 1902, on Her Majesty's service, uh, stamped to Copenhagen, redirected to Essen, and then to the Kruger's Hotel, um, Berlin. And so it's gone all over the place. You can see all the transit marks on the back, but it is from the patent office and, uh, and it has this uh, uh, particular cachet on it. Here's another example of uh, postage from patent office, UK patent office, uh, on Her Majesty's service. Uh, once again, it's got the cache, no need for a stamp because it's staying in the UK and uh, it, uh, within it, it is its acknowledgement uh, of receipt of the following documents uh, and written by the controller of the UK Patent Office. This is one of my favourite items. This is a 1983 Patent Office letter to the fraudster Robert Maxwell. Um, now, you may be aware that last week on Radio 4, there were extracts from a book about, uh, um, a recently published book about the life and times of Robert Maxwell, uh, notorious for falling off his boat and drowning when his uh, fraud was about to be revealed. It is the letter addressed to him, Captain I. R. Maxwell, Chairman, Pergamon Press Limited, as he was then, Headington Hill Hall, Oxford. It has an interesting mistake because uh, the address uh, on the uh, meter mark, the 25 Southampton building, singular, 
when it should be a 25 pound phantom buildings, uh, London WC2A1AW. Uh, as it happens, I worked for Pergamon Press uh, at the time this letter was written in 1983, and I was passed this letter by Robert Maxwell um, uh, as one of his members of staff. I was involved with patterns. I can't remember what the contents of the letter said. I wish I'd kept them, but I did keep the envelope. Uh, so uh, there you have uh, the patent office talking to uh, a fraudster. I thought I'd come back to Clara Barton and um, this is, these are covers, uh, patriotic envelopes from the US Civil War. And they both show the US Patent Office. And you might wonder, uh, and they had a, uh, there were a series of patriotic uh, <coughs> envelopes produced by the Union side um, of well-loved buildings uh, in Washington and elsewhere, uh, uh, what we're fighting for. But why the US Patent Office? Well, there is an explanation, because during the American Civil War, the US Patent Office buildings were converted into a hospital for wounded soldiers. And it's quite possible, I don't know, but it's quite possible that Clara Barton even worked there in the US Patent Office, not as a patent examiner, but returned there as a, 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 a nurse uh, during the American Civil War. I've yet to find out whether she actually did ever return to the patent office. And I want to finish off with um, probably the weirdest Mulready advertising uh, product I've ever come across. I've built up quite a collection of uh, advertising Mulready's because they frequently include adverts for patented products. Um, and the advertising Mulready's give really nice insight into what things were important to the Victorians uh, and the frequent stressing of patented products in these adverts um, it's interesting because they're so, it's so rarely seen these days. You very rarely will see an advert for a product which says, this is patented. Um, so in Victorian times, this was clearly held in very high regard. Okay, so here, here we go to the product. This is the East Anglian envelope advertiser and it's Chubb's Patent Night Commodes. And let me, you won't be able to read the text, so I'm going to read out uh, what it says, or the key part. Designed to, designed to prevent the escape of effluvia. When the cover is put on, it renders the vessel perfectly and permanently airtight. It can remain without offence in the room. And here's the best bit. With the lid down and the drawer out, it answers for the purpose of bed steps. In other words, you can step up and down over it, on it. Presumably, a maid emptied it uh, out and cleaned it each day. And my feeling is every home should have one. I think it's absolutely wonderful advert and uh, engraving shows how it works. And so you close it up and then you step up onto your bed. So isn't that wonderful? I, I think it's the best thing since sliced bread. So that's my talk. Uh, so I will stop sharing now. <laughs>